So we have a question for you. Where have you heard people say that they don't like maths? A, in the classroom. Now, if you're a maths teacher, you may have heard this once or twice this week. B, at a parent-teacher interview. It's not unusual for parents to come in and sit down with their, student, their child and almost sympathise with their child's lack of enjoyment in a maths class. You'll hear parents say things like, well, I was never any good at maths either, or I can't help them with this homework. Algebra was never my strong point. C, your average staff room. Sometimes you might see the English faculty staff standing around the reallocation board just hoping that they haven't been given an extra for maths that day. <laughs> or D, all of the above. If you're like us, it's all of the above. These are the types of conversations we hear each and every day. People who cannot read and write will go to great lengths to hide the fact that they can't read and write. However, when it comes to mathematics, it's almost the opposite. People will proudly tell you that they're not very good at maths. People will almost brag that they can't balance their checkbook. What we have are generations of people who are not very good with maths. They're not very comfortable with number. They're not engaged. So how do we go about changing this? And is it even possible? Well, there is a big negative image surrounding maths education and people can't learn if they're feeling uncomfortable or they feel that they can't do it. So this is what Scott was alluding to. Vygotsky and educators have accepted this, that students can only learn if they're in their zone of proximal development, that place that is just above the stuff that they already know. It's not way above. Way above is, causes too much anxiety. You can't possibly learn if you're doing stuff that's way above what you already know. And similarly, you can't learn if you're doing stuff that's too easy for you. So we know that as educators. Our challenge is, how do you provide for 25 different zones of proximal development in your one classroom? So we do traditionally do some things and you know, with different levels of success. So we'll do things like stream classes. We know that we've got a range in a particular year group from woe to go, and we'll stream them to try and shorten the range that's in any class. Or maybe we'll group students, we'll collapse a couple of classes, and we'll give Miss Awesome the great mathematicians, and we'll give Mr. Misery Guts the rubbish mathematicians, <laughs> and then we'll be surprised when the rubbish mathematicians don't actually manage to progress. Or what happened to us when you're new in a school? you get the lowest in the cohort of the kids because that's what they need. They need the least experienced teacher to teach them. So we might try that. Alternatively, we might do things because, you know, we're really good at fooling kids. Uh, we might group them and we'll call them the sausages, the stars and the moons. <laughs> and they'll never figure out what group they're in. Really? We know that's not true. We know students rank themselves the minute they come into the classroom. They know who the good uh, mathematicians are. They know who the poorer mathematicians are. What they don't want is for us to label them. As soon as we put them in those groups, as soon as we put them in those stream classes, we are slapping a big giant public label on them saying, this is who you are. So it's why it doesn't work. Providing zones where we tell the students what group they're in doesn't work. Labeling the students does not work. So, if we're not going to label the students, but we do have to provide for the zone of proximal development, how do we actually do that? How do we go about effectively providing what, exactly what they need without labeling them? Well, we do this by differentiating. And by differentiating, I mean each and every time I walk into a classroom, I walk in with one activity at a minimum of three levels. All students in the class learn from the one learning intention. However, the degree to which they achieve that learning intention is dependent on the level they've chosen. Tasks are either a one star, a two star, or a three star task. The task is labeled, the students are not. Now, in a non-differentiated non classroom, I might walk in with a bat and a ball. Then 25 students will be expected to hit this ball with this bat. Now we know, as teachers, that this doesn't offer the same degree of difficulty for all students. For some students this is too difficult, and for others this is too hard. In our classroom, this would be an example of a two-star task. Yvonne, 
Yes, miss. Would this two-star task be just right for you? Well, I'm Scottish, and Scottish people are not renowned for being great cricketers, so I'm going to say that I have tried doing that before and I've never been that successful. Okay. So, now, Yvonne's no Don Bradman, and if she were, Gosh. I'd be expecting her to hit the golf ball with the cricket stump. In our classroom, that's an example of a three-star task. Oh. Yvonne, yeah. shall I offer you a one-star task? I'd like to see it, miss. Three stars too much. <laughs> I don't know why you people are laughing. That's, this looks right for me. Now, in our classroom, this is an example of a one-star task. Now, all our tasks can be further differentiated. Yvonne? How do you feel about this? Is this task just right this for you? For me. This is exactly, even though it's a bit heavy, this is definitely the task for me. I've got a chance of hitting this ball with this bat. Thank you, miss. So providing differentiated tasks is one thing, but it's how do we deliver that in the classroom? How we do that is, each time I walk into a classroom, like I said, I walk in with a minimum of three tasks. I will briefly introduce the task of the day and then give an outline of the skills that the students will either need or either ha have in order to complete the tasks. Students will then come up to the front of the room or around the room and they will select either a one star or a two star or a three star task. Once they have selected this task, they then need to find another student or another two students that have also selected the same task as they and then work with them. But it's also important that they pair up with a student who's working at the same mathematical speed as they are. Now, as you can imagine, a class of 25 students, they're all ready and prepared to work on their just right tasks. If I stood up the front of the class and introduced each task and went over how to do a one star task, how to do a two star task, how to do a three star task, I would be boring my students. Most of my students would be disengaged. They would be, have no interest in listening to the instructions that had nothing to do with their task. So instead, what we do is we briefly introduce the task from the front of the room, students come up, select their task, find a person that they need to work with, and then they go and do the task. We as teachers then walk around the classroom teaching at the point of need, providing assistance, providing teaching where it counts and where it's needed. We don't waste students' time, we don't waste learning time by standing up the front of the classroom and giving instructions which aren't important to them. We make sure each and every moment in our classroom is centred around student learning. I just want to say that if there's a, not a big difference between labelling the tasks and labelling the students, then certain things wouldn't happen. And something literally happened to Jodie on Wednesday. We had a taste study. That's when the grade five and six come up to the secondary school and they have a look at what happens in the, their secondary school um, structure, uh, get a feeling for the place. And a kid actually spoke to Jodie on Wednesday, and it's, it just was a real poignant moment for me when she told me this story. I don't know if you want to just... Yeah, definitely. So this young boy had asked, um, he'd taken me aside and he asked me privately, he said, oh, if I come to your school, do you have groups in your school? Do you have the low group and do you have the high group in maths? Now, this was a boy who was disappointed already in his mathematical ability. He did go on to tell me that he was in the low group and it didn't make him feel good. So. These are the types of cultures that we're creating, even in our primary school classrooms. This is a boy who was around about 10 years of age. He was already disengaged in mathematics and he was already feeling like a failure. He's still got many more years of education ahead of him. So, is that all there is to it? Do you just need to differentiate <coughs> your activities? Do you just not teach from the front of the class but teach at the point of need? And do you have students who are selecting the task which is just right for them? I think there's another element to it. There's, there's one more thing that we found that we have to incorporate in our classes to maximise student improvement. Um, and that's this idea of developing growth mindsets in the kids. So what I mean by growth mindset, I'm going to illustrate to you just now to give you, I'm going to give you a choice between two classes of kids and who would you rather be teaching? So you can have kids who are in the green class Green class students are really intelligent, they've got a high IQ, but they're the kind of students who won't take risks because they like to be successful. So they won't attempt something unless they know 100% they're going to get it right. <coughs> These kids do grow and do learn, 
but their growth in their learning is a slowish rate because they don't take the risks that it's required to make big improvements. Or you could have a class from the orange group. The orange group are any ability. Can be very intelligent, can be a, a, you know, kids who are struggling with other, you know, academic concepts. But these students don't become completely incapacitated when they make a mistake. These students actually learn from the mistakes and they move forward. They work well in groups, they don't mind sharing. Well, I'm going to presume you would quite like the orange class. I know I do. If I've got a, kit, a class full of orange classes, then I'm going to have maximum growth going on because these students can improve at a faster rate than the students who've got a fixed mindset. So if I want to have a growth mindset happening in my classroom, how do I generate that culture? How do I support that growth mindset culture? Well, what we find is absolutely imperative is that we value only improvement an absolute score, score is of absolutely no interest to us. So if a, stu a student comes up to me with a, an assessment or a task that he's completed and has some score of, say, 98%, to me that's actually a reason to have a conversation with him for making a poor choice in a task that made him score so highly. Getting a high score is not what it's about. Making a big shift is what it's about. Now, we test every... Uh, Every term we have a test and it's an on-demand test, it's online, uh, it's impartial, the teachers don't get to see what's in the test beforehand, you can't prepare the students for this test, they just have to be grown and uh, when the kids come in from their test they want to know their scores right away and I have them with the computer open, I'm ready to give it to them. So I had a couple of students redoing the test and this one boy in my class, and he's, he's one of the cool kids and he, he's up there, he, get, he gets reasonable scores asked his friend who'd come in and asked me what his score was, he asked him what he got. Now this kid told him his score, which was about two and a half years behind the expected level, but the kid was happy. And this boy number one said to him, yeah, but what did you start with? And I said to him, that's the question. It's not what's your score, it's like what's your score since the last time you were tested, what's your improvement, what's your shift? And that culture in a classroom means that every single person is a fully paid up member of that class and they can grow with, without a cap on it. <coughs> and so we find that we have to have both those things. We have to have differentiated tasks, but we also have to have this growth mindset culture in the classroom. So, it sounds not too bad. Is it actually doable? Yes. Is it easy? It's anything but easy. No, it's not easy. Nothing about good teaching is easy. Is it worthwhile? It's absolutely worthwhile. I don't know if you can imagine this. I'm a maths teacher. I can be on the yard at lunchtime in yard duty. It's Friday. The year nines have got double maths when they come back after lunch and they're hunting me down in the yard asking me what we're going to do. Now that's usually the kind of thing that happens only to the foods teachers or the PE teachers, what we're doing after lunch. But they'll hunt down the maths teachers because they're actually excited about what's going to go on in the classroom. And it's all about their, their choice. So, what do we have? So, what we end up with are teams of teachers who have to work together to create tasks. We've got students who make good choices and become completely responsible for their own learning. We have a learning culture <coughs> where students' growth is valued over absolute score. And what we get for really, really lucky is we get a whole cohort of kids who do not hate maths. Thank you. <coughs> <coughs>